Father God, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you are and all that you've made us to be. Um, Lord, I just pray that we could have wisdom and discernment over the words spoken tonight and um, just begin to understand new revelations. Amen. The last time we got into uh, some really cool stuff, and uh, again, I want to encourage you to really middle voice this. Just the interaction discussion last time, I think, really brought some cool revelation. So the whole goal, what we're after is, is be able to disciple people in empower them into the likeness of Jesus. Well, also, at the same time, we want to be discipled and into the likeness of Jesus. Now, last time we were talking about was is that any, any transformation into the likeness of Jesus has to come with a revelation, a word from God. Question is, is how does that word come, come forward to us? It's working together with God. We don't want to di- disciple, try to disciple somebody God's not doing that with. Or also, with that in ourselves, y'all, we don't want to try to do this Christian life. We want to participate in the reality of who God is. And, and we introduce four different ways that we know without a shadow of a doubt God is doing something in our lives. It's very crucial for us to be able to recognize what he's doing so that we can respond accordingly. Now, do you remember last week? I know that we dealt with Matthew 28, the the Great Commission, where it says, go and make disciples. Look, I am with you. Remember, he's talking about that. And in Matthew 16, where Jesus, the disciples went out preaching, and while the Lord worked together with them, so this whole concept of, of doing what God's doing. Do you remember that last week we were talking about working together with God? Okay, so this is what I've got. Make disciples imperative commands, any commands or destinies being spoken into us. As you are going, make disciples. Teach all that Jesus commands. Look, where is Jesus? What is Jesus doing? That's what I've got. That is four-ish thing. So what we want to do is do what God is doing and nothing more, nothing less. John 5, 19, the son does nothing except what he sees the father doing. There's four things. The first thing is God's doing a thing in it. Matthew 28, 28, 18 through verse 20, Jesus spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, remember we talked about that is not a verb. That's what's called a participle. So it's just meaning that as you go, Go, therefore, here's the first verb, command, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, that's not a verb, and teaching them all that I have commanded you. Teaching is not a verb also. But then that's where that it comes in, teaching them to serve all that I commanded you, and lo, look. That's what that word means, look. Look, I am with you. So the very crucial thing of making disciples is to look in relationship to what God is doing and partner with him in that process. And that's whenever I'm hanging out with y'all or, you know, or or whoever. And, you know, my heart is to help every person to grow in the likeness of Jesus is my question is, Lord, what are you doing? And so the question is, is how do we partner with him? Let's go to that Luke 7 passage that I just told y'all. Luke 7, 29. And so Jesus is talking about John the Baptist and how the Pharisees rejected the purposes of God. In verse 30, when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purposes for themselves. Now, by the way, y'all, if anybody says that whatever God's will is going to happen, that ain't the case. Because right here you see the Pharisees and the lawyers rejecting God's purposes for themselves. And so then goes on by not having been baptized with John. Now, watch this. This is a key question. To what shall I compare the men of this generation? What are they like? And then notice what he says about them. They are like children who sit in the marketplace and call to one another, and they say, we have played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. 
So literally what he's saying is something's happening and you should be responding. And so that is so crucial is to recognize what God is doing. I believe that one of the reasons why we have not seen God working to change a nation, change the world, is because we in the church have not been making disciples. We're trying to make converts or get people in the church when it's all about discipling people into the likeness of Jesus. To grow into the likeness of Jesus, one of the crucial dynamics was was to follow him. Remember, Jesus used that statement, follow me, follow me. In Acts chapter 9, being a disciple of Jesus, being a follower of Jesus. Example here, Jesus is playing the flute. Question is, are we dancing? That's the question. So are we recognizing what God is doing in somebody's life? And then how we respond also is on it. Think down to the years, and this is the thing that grieves me, and this is why sometimes I get so intense about stuff, is that I have had situations with people down through the years where I knew without a shadow of a doubt God was doing something, and I recognized it, but I didn't know what to speak into them to help empower them or help lead them into what God was doing in their lives to find freedom. That is one of the reasons why we're doing this. Our heart is that our refuge, this church, is based on about everybody is discipled, Everybody makes disciples. Are we dancing? Four things we know without a shadow of a doubt in Scripture God is doing. And this is the one we introduced last week. Philippians 1, in 1, 1.6, I'm confident this very thing, that he who began the good work in you will perfect it. So then, my beloved, just you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Okay, this big statement. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both the will and the work for his good pleasure. Two things there. Work out, God is at work in you. Interesting thing, and this is the weird thing about how Greek is. It uses these parts of speech that were it alters the timing of things. So here's our part, us, work out, okay? This is a verb that's present. That means now, continuously. Active. That means we're to do it. And it's imperative. Imperative means what? What my command. That means a command. So do this. Now it's interesting. And then you go to Verse 12, for it is God who is at work within you, in us. And this is the interesting thing about this. This is a present participle, middle part participle, present tense. The time of the this gets its time from the leading verb, the verb that goes before it. This tells you when, so it's at the same time this occurs, and this tells you what? Middle voice. Well, it tells you that it's got to do with participating. He is participating. God is doing a work in us, and we are to bring it out. How do you know what God's doing in you? Right now, can you identify what God is doing in you because what God is doing in you, you and I are responsible to specifically what? Work it out. He's working in us, and so he's saying, bring it out. He's playing the dirge. Or playing it, he's playing the flute. And he's going, okay, dance. Now, God's not, we're not puppets. But what I'm just using that, that, that past scripture in Luke, do you know at this moment in time, what God is doing in you. What do you know without a shadow of a doubt God is doing in you? The God's doing a work in you. As I was praying this and studying this, I would study one thing and I'm going, man, God, this is important. 
And then it goes this way. And then I'm going, God, this is important. I'm going, and I, you know, there it was. I had so many rabbits and and I just, I tell y'all this. So really, I, I really ask y'all to listen very clearly right now. What is God doing in you? What's some of the ways that you know that God's doing a work in you so you can respond? You have conviction. Conviction. Okay, show me that in Scripture. He convicts us of what? Righteousness. Doesn't convict us of sin. He convicts us of righteousness. So he convicts us of righteousness. What does that feel like? What does convict mean? What does it look like? The word convict means really the picture of it is to bring to the light. What does it feel like? The Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness. That's a really good, that's really good. Let me give you an example of that. Go to Matthew 10, 20. Start, start verse 19. And read 19 and 20. This is what Q is talking about. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. The spirit of your father who speaks in you. So you know God is doing something in you. When he convicts you or speaks into you righteousness. What does that feel like? What does it sound like? Okay, who's who's revealing? You said the Holy Spirit, right? It's convicting. So what does that feel like? It'll feel this. You'll feel this, what I'm thinking. But I'm... How do you know anything's in relationship with the Holy Spirit? Huh? What is peace? Fruit. Fruit of the Spirit. Jesus says, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. There's the words that he's speaking are spirit. So like he's saying, the Holy Spirit is, he's revealing us in us, the spirit of our Father who's in us. Uh, the Luke, Luke, Luke parallels this, saying the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour. So the Holy Spirit in you, so you will feel love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Now, it can start to manifest and like, Woo! It can cause things to happen in us, but it's going to be in the relationship to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. So, what about when you sin and then you just feel disgusted? Do what? You sin and then you just feel disgusting. <laughs> well, that okay. Now, this is this is a uh, this is when we're going to get into this a little bit more. In, important uh, um, when a revelation comes forth. Okay, so when you're talking about the fruit, this whole fruit of the Spirit stuff, so you're talking about when the Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness, of not convicts us of, and not when we're feeling conviction because we've done something wrong or we're in sin. Even when you hear something, the Holy Spirit, that reveals an area of sin, it's going to be a righteousness. It's not going to convict us of sin. But you're going to hear it, and it will accompany with love and joy and peace. Now, eventually, but not at first. It, 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 it will. So sometimes it makes you feel like you just ate Waffle House. So Gross and greasy inside. The word of the Lord is greasy? What, what y'all are wrestling with here is a very important thing to think about. Because when a word comes forth, a revelation comes. God's doing a work in us, and he's given a revelation. One of three things can happen. I'm just following your lead, convicting us of righteousness. Let's go to Matthew 13, 20. The one on whom the seed is sown on rocky places is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with what? Joy is what? Through the Spirit. I, ah, joy. Okay. Yet he himself has no fruit, firm root in himself, but is only temporary. But when affliction, literally that Greek word there is tribulation, with tribulation and persecution 
arise. Why? Okay, who is the author of persecution and tribulation? Satan is the author of it. So first thing is, a revelation comes. Satan's going to steal it. Try to steal it. Literally, what's going to happen anytime you receive a word, you receive it with joy, you're going to notice that this occurs. Because this is the bridge between this and this. And Mason's saying, all of a sudden you feel like you ate at Waffle House. Why is that? I'm trying to explain that. Go to, go to Psalm 105, verse 15. Do not touch my anointed ones. Do not do my harm. Do my prophets no harm. And he called for a famine upon the land, and he broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They afflicted his feet with fetters, and he himself was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. Notice what it says here. The word of the Lord tested him. What's testing him here? The word is. God's not testing it. The word is. Now, what does that mean? The word of the Lord tests him. So, okay, okay, let me ask you this. When you receive a word, where do you receive it? Where you receive by faith in your heart. Okay, so a revelation of God comes in, into your heart. A lot of times when we receive a word, guess what? To receive it, something else has got to go. Because the word is trying to impart what in us? Truth, yes. Transform us into what? So all of a sudden, I hear a word, a revelation from God. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So I hear this word. You are trying to receive the word that husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church, but all of your mountain man philosophy that you grew up on has got to get out first before that can stick. So the word is testing me. In other words, anything that is in me that's not in likeness of who? Jesus making me feel uncomfortable. And a lot of this stuff that's coming on in us, y'all, uh, is stuff we want to hold on to. Let me, let me invite you into one of my, my excursions with the Lord. Go into 1 Peter chapter 1. Four, verse 12. Proof there is a word that describes like a heating of gold. So it's coming in and it's hot. The other thing I was going to say, like, for example, like in the Psalm 105 passage, when I was talking about in Joseph's case, so there was a work, obviously there was a work obviously going on in Joseph's heart, like, but it was like through like a lot of like the external circumstances that came upon his life. But I'm not sure there's like the necessary the, the word always tests us in like such a way. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Well, I think that's where the, it's not either or. What was the first one I said? The first one was I said Satan was the one that tests. So Satan comes to steal a word. So there was a destiny word out there in relationship to Moses. So what Satan starts trying to do? Steal it. Steal it. How, what's the first thing he started right, trying to kill every kid? It's in the age of Moses. Jesus is coming on the scene. There's a word for the Messiah coming. So Satan goes, this thing's coming this time. So let's just kill every kid in, you know, in that particular region. So it was a situation with Joseph, because you could say that, you know, Satan threw him in prison and slavery and all this kind of stuff, right? He's at work in it. Yep. And the word's testing him too. He's got a word to be a ruler. So when, and when God says you're going to be a ruler, it's in the likeness of him. A heart, the rule that serves. Well, Joseph, and when he first gets the vision about being a ruler, he's to his brothers, y'all going to paraphrase, y'all going to bow down to me. And then he goes to his mom and dad, y'all going to bow down to me. I'm a, you know, that's a paraphrase. He's not ruling the serve. He's the coat of many colors, brother. <laughs> it's the island, you know? 
So by the time when his brothers come on the scene and he goes through a bunch of stuff, he's a guy that's ready to forgive and go, you know, y'all guys meant this for evil, but God has meant this for good. In other words, he's going, God's caused all things to work out for good in this thing. So he's able to be free to love his brother. He'd have been worldly ruler in that point in time. He'd have axed his brothers quicker than anything. So that's one of the reasons why when all of a sudden you get a word from God, it gets uncomfortable. All right, so let me ask you a question, because when you were asking how can you tell if God's doing something, the first thing that came to my mind was there's a trial. You know what I mean? And I thought about James 1. And now that's here. Okay. That's a whole other thing. All right, so, but also my question, though, in that, as we're talking about this thing, is there always a word before the trial? So, like, for example, you know, if you're in a trial, have you already received a word does that does that sort of make sense? Consider it like James 1. Consider it all joy, brethren, you know, when you encounter all various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance. So is, when there's a trial, is there always a word, or does the trial indicate maybe that God is doing something? Maybe the, maybe the trial could be the word that God is doing something in you, or maybe the stuff that's coming out of you is the word that God is doing something Okay, this is the negative thing about that. Trial is the same Greek word as this. To answer your question, Ted, no. Because that's why you'll notice here that there's revelation that's separate, separate from adversity. There's adversities that will occur in our lives that have no nothing to do with the revelation being given. It's just because you're in the world. In this world, you will have Tribulation. Well, you don't have to do anything. Could you know? the word just be that you are a son slash daughter? That's the word. I mean, when you're in as a son slash daughter in the world, you will be tested. You will be squeezed. But that word will be tested in some way, shape, or form. You receive that. Right. Jesus, yeah, Jesus is an example of that. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Immediately, he's led into the wilderness. To be by the Holy Spirit, to be tempted by the devil. Be like a rhema word that's being tested, but like any of those words, logos, logos words are being tested as well. Not necessarily, no. Because they're not. It, it's not. It's not important faith then to you. But could it be like a like a preheating the oven to receive? Because sometimes a trial. The various trial could get you to a place where you're like, man, I need to hear a word because I'm experiencing tribulation and I don't have a rock to stand on. Yeah, that's where you're here. You're talking about you're in the midst of an adversity. Right. And what's happening in an adversity, a need is manifesting. And one of the ways that, that God satisfies and fulfills needs us in us is a word. It, th these two are interesting. They're, they're similar, but... What has happened? What comes first? That's the, that's the difference between these two. You could have an adversity or a need, and then a revelation could be imparted, or you could just receive a revelation without having an adversity. And both have, can both be true. Every word of the Lord will be tested. The word is going to be tested some way, shape, or form. Here, you'll get a word that fulfills the need. If there's a revelation being tested, that's here. But when we're talking about we're in some type of adversity, like a wilderness, persecution, temptation or tribulation or persecution you're in one of those type of adversities some type of need will be manifesting in that and so there will be an opportunity for god is coming to fill and satisfy that need it's implanted into your heart example mm -hmm. an adversity mm -hmm. My mom is sick and dying in the hospital. And so Satan it starts ta taunting me in that that thing, where's your where's your God? Well, God starts speaking to me in I'm in need, y'all. I am in need. I'm in the back of the hospital crying out to God, yelling at God. I am hurting. And in that time, God speaks to me strong. 
very strong and speaks to me and comforts my heart. And there was a revelation happened that was implanted in my heart that you guys hear the fruit of all the time. God's good. He's good. So an adversity is like an overcoming and a testing is plowing through the wall. When you're test, the word is tested or the, if this is to fill and satisfy, fulfill a need, the word's tested by temptation. Count it all joy and counter various trials or temptations, but knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result that you might be what? Perfect, complete. That's implanted. That's over here. And that takes it all the way. Uh, we glory in our tribulation. We exult in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance, proven character. And then it says, in proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. This hope don't disappoint fruit and it all came out of the midst of a word being tested and adversity could be an obstacle in the way but it could also be the same as a testing it is it is the test it is the testing so we should look at this in relationship to this chart the adversity comes you're like oh okay so i need to go search and understand and receive to then get to the testing part so that it gets implanted I guess, we, I guess back here, we were just thinking like, well, what's the difference between adversity and a testing? Or are they one and the same? Because there's, on this chart here, there's it's two different spots. This is the beginning of God doing a work in you. Either the first one is where God is going to initiate something and he's wanting to release into you a destiny or he's preparing you for something or He's wanting to impart into you something like Doug said, a son or a daughter, you know, so he's his his heart is to see you into the likeness of Jesus. And you're in that place now in another level of glory. So he speaks that level of glory. He reveals that level of glory. OK, that'll be tested. But there's an adversities that every one of us face in this world. And usually adversities that we face in this world will manifest a need where it's an opportunity of faith. Fulfilling that need, then in that whole process of adversity need, God fulfilling the need with the revelation, then that's also kind of simultaneously where the testing's happening or is the testing going to come separate? Testing comes first and the, then the revelation comes and it's birthed in you. Here, the revelation so comes and it's tested. I really do wish there was another way but in this world, we have tribulation. Unfortunately, that's how humans work. It just, it sticks that way because you because you really in the testing you really got to wrestle with it and make it your own. I read something in the Passion Translation the other day out of Matthew four one, and it speaks into this and it says afterwards the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the lonely wilderness in order to reveal his strength against the accuser by going through the ordeal of testing. So to me, it's like just to reveal to Jesus how strong he is against the accuser. He was tempted in all points as we... The question y'all are asking right here, let's just say, let's just take an example here. Okay. How this can be. Has nothing to do with this, but this. Let's just take, let's just take this thing right here. Why would you be tempted or tried? One thing is that God speaks a revelation, so it'll be tested. Satan tempted Jesus. When Satan tempts Jesus, what does 1 Corinthians 10, 13 say? No temptation or trial. So I wanted to know the difference between um, a test and then a temptation. And then which one is from God and which one is from the devil? This means, this is the Greek word dokimazo. That means to, to prove something, to, to establish the, the value. Check out how it works. Like 
somebody goes to drive a car and they want to test it out. They want to see how it works. That's testing. So the testing of your faith. Oh, in other words, you're finding out how much is value. The testing of your faith being more precious than gold. Okay, how valuable is your faith? Is your faith real? The only way that that can be validated is in the midst of a trial. That's what this is. This, it, it means doorway, pass through. It's like that door. Mike just went through the door. That is a temptation. Satan puts before us doorways to pass into sin. God, it, there's only one place in all the scripture where it uses the word tempt in relationship to God but it was in a relationship to Abraham in Hebrews eleven seventeen, where it says that God tempted Abraham, but it was tempting him in relationship to faith. So the doorway that was in front of Abraham was a doorway of faith. If Abraham stepped into it, he stepped into faith. When Satan puts a doorway in front of you, you're stepping into sin. So, um, so Satan's trying to tempt, put doorways of compromise. So this... Notice this, how these come combined in James 1. You know, counter joy, encounter various trials. Okay, there's a doorway of something. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces something, endurance. So, does that make sense? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation is overtaking you, but such as, as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will not so that you'll be able to endure it. Okay, so you can be tempted. This kind of revelation and this kind of tempting, God says, He will be faithful to us, that we will not be tempted beyond that which you can bear. More than the word that you you're giving that He's given to you, you can handle. Temptation will also provide a way of escape. This in this, God's saying there's always a door, there's always a way of escape if it's like it's in a relationship to them. But this can happen here. God has nothing to do with it. In James 1, now y'all, why are we doing this? Why are we chasing this rabbit? To be honest with you, you know what we're doing? This is discipling. This is wrestling with that because, you know, if you're going to disciple somebody, you you're going to be sitting down in front of them and it's either God's speaking something or they're in the midst of this and in relationship to a revelation and you're helping them process it. And that's what we're, why we're doing with this. What you say to them is we want to create hope. I pray God right now that as we're talking about this, this produces hope. Not, not that it's going to, everything's going to be nice and easy, y'all. I, I wish I could say that. But that's not the case. I've been I prayed that 45 years ago. Counted all joy, encountered various trials, knowing the testing of your faith. Okay. All right. So one through two through four is talking about temptations or trials. All right. One twelve. Blessed is the man who what? Persevere perseveres under trial. Once he's been approved, he receives the crown of life. Now that, y'all, my conviction is that that crown of life is not necessarily at the end. It's now. When something, we're tempted, we are approved, it produces life in us. But then verse 13 says, let no one say when he's being tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot tempt anyone to what? Evil. But what? Why are you tempted, George? Read it. But so each one is tempted when they're drawn away by what? Okay, so you're in a temptation. You're in adversity. So there is something, y'all, this is my honest conviction. You're being tempted to sin. This is why, this is why James 1 is talking about temptations in relationship to sin. Jesus was 
not tempted by in John, in Matthew 4 in relationship to sin, him being enticed by sin. So not every temptation or trial is because, oh, I got sin in me. No. There's other something else maybe going on, and we can talk about it in a second. But what's happening in this situation, somebody's being tempted because of their own what? Lust. So there is a need. I'm fasting. I walk in the dwelling place, go through the kitchen. There's a box of stale donuts. I walk by it. I grab one of those donuts, take a bite. I'm going, what am I doing? Two things are a problem with this. One, this is stale. It's terrible. And the second thing is I'm fasting. <laughs> but why was I enticed to eat a stale donut? Because I was, I was in need. <laughs> If you're full, if you're full from whatever food you like, you're totally full. You're, you are not going to be tempted to eat out of a trash can. But that's why all of a sudden you're tempted to sin. You're drawn away by your own lust. You're in an adversity because of lack. But technically God can tempt you in relationship to faith if you wanted to, right? Yeah, but it's not because of lack. Well, I'm just making a, well, I'm just saying... Because you say, like, well, tempt and race and say, like, Satan tempts into sin, right? But God can tempt, but not in relation to sin, right? He will tempt you. He'll, he'll, remember, temptation means doorway. doorway. That's what I mean. So right? God's got, there's this doorway for you to step into. You're saying to be tempted to faith is that there's a doorway there for you to walk through. Most of the other, like, the rest of Christianity would be calling that, you know, God's testing your faith. Now, I'm not saying they're right. I'm saying that's what it could also be called. Or what yeah. it looks like in a different verbiage. Yeah. So it's a little more familiar. Sin's not in the sin's not in the equation for God. When he when he says, here it is, it's not, it's not his, he's not even thinking that. He's thinking Abraham. He tempted Abraham in relationship to Isaac. And it was a doorway for Abraham to be what? Father of many nations. So that's God's heart for Abraham. Yeah, yeah, what you said was good. Go, go to Luke 22, 45 and 46. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his Amen. sweat became like drops of blood, falling down upon the ground. And, and when he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Arise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Pray that you may not what? Now, there's an example of what temptation is. Pray that you may not what? Enter into. But okay. But the intimation in this, y'all, why are they tempted? What's he talking about? Tell them to pray. So that they won't what? Be tempted. But the intimation is they would be tempted because they're not what? Praying. There's this massive spiritual pressure. And so what happens is, is there's this, there, there'll be events that are transpiring that adversities are popping up. There is no more spiritual warfare that is occurring that night than that night when Jesus is in the garden there. So what's happening is you can step into situations that the way to keep from going to temptation is pray. For example, some of y'all sometimes go hang around with me and you go into when you start hanging around with me, if you just step in and hang around with me and just go hang around when I'm doing dealing Jesus and you ain't been praying, I guarantee this, you're going to enter into temptation. Because the level of spiritual warfare is so high, it just opens you up to being tempted. Proverbs 22, 14. Help me understand this verse. Mouth of an adulteress is deep. You curse is cursed of the Lord will fall into it. Cursed of the Lord. Why would you be cursed of the Lord? You said so when I see a dude that uh goes into the deep pit of an adulteress he's cursed to the lord so it sounds like someone who is cursed like a curse will create like an environment for them to sin i mean we could go let's do the king james version the mouth of a strange woman is a deep pit he that is abhorred of the lord how fall therein fall into fall into what though you got to answer the question fall into what and the, like, the way it sounds like is like, hey, if God doesn't like you, he's going to let you go. Uh, he's never not that the case. 
There's there's places that. So that, you're saying that that looks like the temptation of the Lord. It doesn't say the it doesn't say the Lord's doing it. It just says like if you have a curse on you, right? Yeah, but it says the Lord's the one cursing them. Yeah, the, no, in the courtroom of heaven, there's curses that are released all the time. The land a land starts to commit an abortion, shedding of innocent blood. That releases what? That releases a curse. Comes out of the courtroom of heaven. Remember in the Old Testament of the Lord, a spirit from the Lord haunted uh, Saul? You and I have been through that many times. Anything of the Lord, when you see something like that, you know it's coming out of the courtroom of heaven. And I, I don't have a problem with their curses generating out of that. Okay, so we're talking about temptations and adversities. Okay, so one, when you enter a temptation, God would not be, well, you'd be tempted or tried beyond that which you can bear. Other thing, as I said, was, is that you can be tempted. Why? You come into an adversity because of what? Because in James 1, because of what? Sin. Second thing I just showed you was why an adversity can occur. You can enter into a spiritual warfare. Jesus said, pray that you may not be be led into temptation. And another place in Luke, he says, pray that you may have the, the strength to stand. Prayerlessness exposes us to stuff that we don't have to be exposed to. That's the crazy thing about that. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Even the prayer that Jesus taught his disciple, he said, like, pray as this. And then he says, lead us not into temptation. That's a, that's a good point, George, yeah. But who's leading them? Like, who's they? Well, the interesting thing is, they, the they think they're prayed for. Pray, okay, what's the verse before that? You quoted, uh, you've quoted in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You know what the verse before that's talking about? Unforgiveness. You know what the verse after that's talking about? Unforgiveness. So that means that one in the middle is what? Unforgiveness. So unforgiveness can lead you to what? Well, that's another one of these. This sin can lead you into an adversity. Look at this one here. This is kind of interesting. Verse did I say or six, verse 10? Look at verse 9. 6 9. Those who want to get rich, present tense, present, active, indicative, in other words, it says, it's going to happen. Notice what it says. Those who want to get rich fall into what? Temptation. If there's a desire in a person to get rich, guess what's going to happen to them? They're going to be what? Tempted. God doesn't have anything to do with that. So you said God doesn't have anything to do with it, so he doesn't have anything to do with getting rich? So it's in the context. Notice what it says, verse 10. What's it talking about? The what? Love of money. So if there's a place in me that's going, okay, I want to get rich. I need, that's money is my, is my source. There will be a temptation. One more, just real quick, just to show you this, because, because a lot of people, this is the thing, the reason why I'm saying I'm doing this, y'all. I hear people say that stuff doesn't, nothing can happen to you that God doesn't first come across God's desk. Well, y'all, guess what? The disciples, Jesus is telling them, pray that you may not be in a temptation. Well, guess what? Or, or, we looked at well, money, love of money. Guess what? We'll get you what? Tempted. God has nothing to it. The warning, the door of escape is in the beginning. Let me give you this last one. Look at 1 Corinthians 7. Sometimes we're in an adversity, y'all, that God has nothing to do with. But, God promises us he causes what? All things to what? So with God, obstacles are always opportunity. Y'all, I have fallen in the trap of love of money, but in that love of money was a massive opportunity for God to do a work in my heart. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. 
stop depriving one another as husband and wife, except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer and come together so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Husband and wife, in this whole context here, whenever you're seeing where a husband and wife are, are separated from one another and there's this deal going on where the physical relationship is being hindered, I guarantee you this, the husband's going to, I said, just don't put it on the husband, you know. Somebody's going to be tempted. Can be tempted. So like fall like into temptation doesn't necessarily mean like you're going to fall like into sin or just fall like in like having the doorway put before you. Which one is it? Doorway. The there. doorway. So you'll fall into like the temptation. Like the doorway will be always will be present before you, will be presented before you, but you don't necessarily have to go into it. Like you don't necessarily right. Okay. All right. All right. There's gonna be a fight. There's gonna be a fight that God has not desired you to fight. God doesn't, God's heart for me is not fight the fight in relationship to getting rich. He don't want me to have to fight that. So how did he do it? He told me in his word, watch out, Rick, for the love of money. He told Paul and I in relationship to 1 Corinthians 7, you can expose yourself to a bunch of stuff. And praise God, Paula really believes that word. So just real quick for, as an example, like, I don't know, for like myself, like I have no desire for, drugs or anything so like if a like i don't know someone offered it to me to me it wouldn't feel like a temptation to me like it wouldn't feel like there's nothing in my flesh that would entice me to want to entertain that but is that but is that still technically like a doorway that's being placed there by satan like a temptation right even if it's not enticing to my flesh there is a time and a way yeah i mean i understand what you're saying that you yeah could be tempted to use drugs Look at Galatians 6 1. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. So I'm dealing with somebody and I got a high and mighty attitude. Guess what? I'm going to get what? Tempted the same way. The reason I was asking is when it says like you know like okay like like the love of like if you those who desire to get rich will fall into temptation. So if you protect yourself from having the love of money, right? And Satan puts that doorway. It's, it's nothing. No. Hmm. Yeah, it's nothing. It's like fishing with the wrong kind of bait. Yeah, he he he. Let's put it this way: he ain't dumb. <laughs> he's been doing this for thousands of years. So <laughs> he's not going to throw bait in front of something that you know he knows that it's not. I will say this. The temptation to drink or smoke is, is nothing for me. Temptation of pornography is nothing. But I have to tell you, there have been times that all of a sudden thoughts in relationship to drinking or drugs went into my mind. Why? Because I was starting to deal with some other people that were in that same boat. And so I get frustrated with them and start in my heart, start making judgments for them. And so guess what? You know, get a little pressure. There was a doorway there because of the judgment that you entered into. Sometimes I don't feel like I get tempted into a doorway. I just feel like sometimes I get thrown through a door. That's okay. a stronghold, right? Yeah. Like yeah. there's sometimes you don't have a choice whether you're going through that doorway or not. To lay aside, but if you got demonic, you know, the four levels, unless you deal with the stronghold, you're not going to be able to renew a mind or not. You know what I'm saying? Like, if someone's got a stronghold of this and there's a doorway of temptation in front of them, they're not going to be able to not walk through it without that stronghold, getting delivered that stronghold. They can get through it. They just got to fight. Then why do we pray through stronghold? To get victory over the fight. Well, like, for example, I'm driving down Interstate 81. This has probably been 15 years ago. Drive down the Interstate 81, somewhere around Marion. Remember where I was at? All of a sudden, this relationship I had with a girl 
when I was a freshman in college, starts flooding my mind, and I cannot get it out of my head. And it's not a cool relationship, okay? So I can't get it out of my head. So all of a sudden, I hear the Lord say, repent. Because why was it stuck there? Because there was a stronghold with there. So it didn't pull me into something. I just I go, wait a minute, this is here. So I dealt with the stronghold. And it goes away just like that. Yeah, but she knew how to deal with that. What about the person that doesn't know how to deal with well, that? Well, that's, that's where my people perish because of the lack of knowledge. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's the point I'm making. If you're in a stronghold, how will you have a choice to not walk through a door with temptation? Deal with the stronghold. I didn't even know what a stronghold was, so that's what I'm saying. But in that place. Well, what hope does a person have if they're dealing with a stronghold and don't have knowledge of how to deal with it? That's why Jesus is the hope. Okay, this is a pathway, a hallway. And notice these, I only haven't described these as baffled. So you get enticed into a sin. Okay, one time. So, so you step through this. And you try to step back. Okay, so I fall into that particular sin. Okay. For example, uh, a guy lusts after a woman. I see this beautiful woman that he's, that he's working with or that, he's, that he goes to school with or whatever. So he lusts after her. Man looks at a woman to lust after her. He what? Commits adultery with her what? In his heart. So he, he realizes that. So he steps into it. But if he don't deal with it, he steps back. But he lets himself go there. Next time around, it, it repeats only twice. And it gets here. This becomes harder to back out. That each time you fall into that particular sin and try to come out of it, it gets more and more difficult. That's why I like particularly like when, you, when you're dealing with like spirit of um, a Jezebel or a spirit of homosexuality. There's repeated sins, and so they're trying to come out of it, but coming out of it has such opposition in it that it's so difficult. They can still come out of it, but you're going to have to fight to get out of it. The reason that it's so hard to get out of it is because their mind is programmed like quickly to go to that sin. So renewing of the mind is so much point. more harder. It happens here once, you program it once. Happens twice, again, you, you're programmed again. So you got two programs in your heart, two sectors. Program happens again, you program three sectors. Each, each time it gets the opposition. That's a very good illustration, John. Yeah, there's, there's multiple strongholds, if you want to say. You know, like, for example, that situation with that girl I was in freshman in college. It was nothing for me to, oh, repent. Okay, Oof. you're out of it. But there's been things that were like that I had repeatedly held on to something in relationship to that. And so I started trying to deal with it. It was a fight to come out of. It. That's not impossible, y'all. You just have to fight. But why did I go through this? We were talking about adversity. And what I was doing was really trying to establish to show you that some adversities that we enter into, God has nothing to do with. In fact, let me just close with this passage. Go to 1 Timothy, Peter, chapter 1, verse 6. I just really got to brag on my wife. My wife uh, is so secure in who she is that when I tell my, put my trash out on the table, she doesn't get threatened. Now, she will rebuke me favorably at times in relationship to sometimes I run my mouth when I shouldn't, but, but I just. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. Did you notice the word there? If necessary. There's some trials, some temptation that you and I face are not necessary. And I just showed you about five or six of them. They're not necessary. However, when you do encounter them, the verse says, 
the proof of your faith being more precious than gold. So when you get you get tempted or tried, turn around and win it. Going back to James 1 to 12, talks about the crown of life. Uh, can you uh, expound on uh, why it is described as a crown, the significance of that? And I say, I don't know. Yes, you can. I, I really don't know, Doug. A lot of people think that that past scripture is talking about end, you know, and it's kind of hard to think, it, hardcore to think about for once you've been approved. I will say this, y'all. Y'all do realize this, that every one of us in here, our faith has to be proven. Uh, this word right here that Dorcas asked me about. In the courtroom of heaven. Because there are accusations against you and I that we don't believe. There are accusations, there are claims on the inheritance that you and I have. Do you realize that the destiny of uh, to on the sons of God are to inherit the world? But do you realize in Scripture there's at least three different groupings of sons of God in Scripture? One of them are demons. Fallen angels claim in Genesis 6, claim to be sons of God. And you see that repeated in Genesis and Job chapter 1. So demons claim our inheritance. They, they stole it from us. They stole it from Adam and, Adam and Eve. They're claiming our inheritance. The thing that I want to speak to is you're, it's just not some flippant thing going around, y'all. The question is, do you and I believe? And there's so, and, and it's just not in relationship to heaven and hell. It's in relationship to Literally, the inheritances that the levels of glory that God has for us for us to step into can only be received by faith. That's why it says, you know, glory to glory, Romans 1, faith to faith, and James, John 1, grace to grace. So when you are encountering these situations, don't let it frustrate you. That's why Paul says, count it joy. James says, we exult in this. Peter says, yeah, rejoice. Man. I, you know, one of my favorite, I'd say not one of my favorite, but it really interesting to me, that when Peter and John got beaten by the Pharisees in order not to speak, and John in Acts 4, they went away rejoicing that they could be considered worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. And worthy means to be brought into balance. They're going, dude, we, we walked in something that, that we're, we got persecuted for. Glory to God. So they caught picture of it. And so, you know, a lot of times us, we get to this place that we go, Man, we get we get some persecution and affliction, and we're going, man, what did I do wrong? No, maybe what we did right. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself up for me. That the way they walked, they were dead. They. Jesus said, carry your cross and follow me. And that's how they learn to walk. A person who is full refuses honey, but um, even better food is to, sweet to the hunger. That's from Rover 27.7. It's just what we shared about temptation, like when we're hungry. Um, just try to get anything. And that when the enemy comes with the temptation. It's, you know, I just want y'all to know the thing behind the things not just have flipping answers for people in the middle of real life circumstances now on the last day the great day of the feast jesus stood and cried out saying if anyone is thirsty let him come to me and drink he who believe in me as 
the scriptures say it from his innermost being will flow river of living water. So God, we just um, declare that we do thirst for you, God. We believe that we our thirst can be quenched in you, God. Um, as we go through those weeks, God, uh, our eyes are on you, God, that you are the fulfiller of, of our need and the answer of our thirst, God. God, we just pray that uh, just help us to like eye with you, God, as we walk toward you, God, that we behold you to become more and more like you. God, we just pray that you give us grace, God, to um, just um, learn more, God, and extend the the limits of our understanding. In Jesus' name I pray.